in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. Three brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Hello, all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. Today, I am joined by my good friend and co-host in Spokane, Washington, Brian Fry. How are you doing, Brian? Doing well, Russ. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm I'm feeling uh, maybe maybe patriotic today. What, what, what would you say? Oh, I think that's accurate. Yeah, yeah. So it's Veterans Day, and uh, for Veterans Day, we brought in first time guest and an actual real veteran, Captain Tyler Fitzgerald, stationed out of the Washington D.C. area. Tyler, how are you doing, sir? Awesome. Glad to be here. Well, we got to get the audience to know you just a little bit. So first thing is, what is the last movie you saw? The last movie I saw, I think, was a while ago. I went to go see Toy Story 4 with my family. Oh, I haven't seen the fourth one. Uh, how is it? It's decent. It's, uh, you know, a continuation of uh, just trying to drag out that same storyline, but adds in a few more adult-like feels. Do they, uh, do they pull at your heartstrings like they do in Toy Story 3, or is it uh, maybe not quite on that level? I never saw three, but they attempt to pull on a lot of heartstrings, yeah. Okay. I still avoid up like the plague. Okay. Did, how, how did your little man like it? Well, as far as his attention span lasted, he liked it. Okay. I guess that's the benchmark of how, however long it'll work. Now, I know you're a dog lover, so I got to ask, what is your favorite on-screen dog? I'm probably going to have to go with the Hound from Fox and the Hound. I didn't uh, see that movie until I was an adult, and so I think I have a bigger appreciation for the subtle messages of like loyalty and sacrifice in that movie. i would be honest with you, I haven't seen it since I was a kid, and I haven't seen it as an adult, and I've heard, I've, I, I didn't necessarily come away with a very good review of that as a kid, so like you're saying, it's one of those ones where I'm wondering, what's that like to come back to? Yeah, you definitely need to rewatch it. Uh, there's, there's a lot you're not going to pick up on as a kid that... Um, you know, it talks about life and how it's not as straightforward as you think it might be. Interesting. And Brian, you are also a dog lover. Should I throw the same question to you? What's your favorite on-screen dog? I think mine's going to be Shadow from Homeward Bound. Oh, perfect. Ooh, good choice, good choice. I'm going to go with the uh, dog uh, from As Good As It Gets. It warms Jack Nicholson's cold heart, whether it be little strips of bacon out of the bag or whatever. I, I, I just like that little dog. It uh, somehow... Uh, that movie would, did, would. I have very mixed reviews on that movie. There's a lot of darkness in that movie, and that dog definitely brought uh, some pick me up moments to a much needed, uh, much needed in that movie. So, I will give a comedic second runner up on that to the poodle from Pets, who's jamming out the system of a down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good scene. So, just, <laughs> so what movie do you think that you have seen more than any other movie in the course of your life, Tyler? Well, I don't rewatch movies now as an adult like I did when I was a kid. So I think my most watched movies are all kind of kid movies like Princess Bride or Newsies. Um, and then Return of the Jedi as well. That's all it. Those are all good choices there. And uh, yeah, I think anybody, I think that's going to be true for anybody. You get such a head start when you're young. That's going to mm-hmm. be that's going to be the uh, return to thing. That are Christmas movies that just have like an annual built in kind of uh you know, I return to them once a year kind of things. Right. And then I would say it's followed closely by Black Hawk Down, which uh, I believe you attempted to eviscerate in last year's Veterans Day episode. So, oh. <laughs> You know, that was the cursed episode. There's, there's a lost episode that we'll never hear that had uh, that had three of us on there. and <laughs> Then two I, of us. Yeah, I did not record it at all. And uh, sure enough, I had to sit, come back. We did it twice the night next night so good news is we're recording and this is already going better than the black hawk down mission so excellent who is an actress that you think is an underrated actress and deserves more credit tyler i would have to choose 
Rosie Huntington Whitley, that uh, of Transformers fame. Uh, I don't think she gets enough credit for running in heels through the rubble of a destroyed city. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Michael Bay is a polarizing figure. I'm always, I always come to the defense of him. I'm just like, hey, there's a time and a place for Michael Bay. He does what he does. And you got to set the bar at the right place and just enjoy it. So Yeah, it's entertainment value. Exactly. As we get prepared to go into today's movie, I wanted to talk a little bit more. So it's the Veterans Day episode. Tell people what it is that you're currently doing for the U.S. Army. So I'm an infantry officer. I've been in for about 11 years, and I'm currently a defense fellow working in a congressman's office. So I, I work kind of liaison between the Army and uh, Capitol Hill. Interesting. So are you, is this, uh, you're, you're headed for a career of politics then? Is that what that puts you on track for, or is this just the, the, next, the, the latest stop? And the latest stop in the army, yeah, not uh, a stop on for politics at all. Got it. So, for the people at home, if, if I'm not mistaken, right, you were deployed in the Middle East, is that right? Yeah, I have one one deployment of just seven months in Afghanistan. Well, we thank you for that. So, and we're glad you came back. Okay, today's movie is Brian. We are doing 2002's We Were Soldiers. That's right. We were soldiers. Grosses $78 million. It places at 34th on the box office that year. It comes in behind Snow Dogs, and it comes in ahead of Gangs of New York. The number one movie that year is Spider-Man. Uh, that's the Tobey Maguire one. Brian, do you want to give your uh, obligatory <sighs> sigh? There, there it is. Yeah, he does that every time. It never gets new. Um, so IMDb is We Were Soldiers a 7.1. Uh, the critics of uh, Rotten Tomatoes give it a 63%, but the audience likes it a lot more and gives it an 84%. No awards hardware on this one, so let's get into it. Tyler, had you seen We Were Soldiers before? If so, what was the first time, and what was it like coming back to it now? Oh, yes, I've seen it many times before. The first time was actually pretty special to me. I was in high school, and I went to go see it with my best friend from high school, Andrew McConnell, and he was one of the biggest influencers on me later in life and joining the army. Uh, and then he was later killed in combat. So this movie has a pretty special place in my heart. Coming back to it now, I I definitely have a different opinion of it because I've been in the army and I can you know appreciate not only the tactical but the strategic implications of the whole battle. So is it? Would you say it's holding up, or it's just a whole different movie now that you're in the walk of life that you're in? No, I think it's holding up. That's good. Brian, what about you? For We Were Soldiers, had you seen it before? If so, when was the first time, and what was it like coming back to it now? Uh, I saw it the, when it was out in theaters when it first came out. I probably purchased it not long after and have proceeded to slowly beat it to death over the course of all these years. I mean, I'm sure I've probably had some some gaps where I didn't watch it much, but when I found out we were watching it for the podcast, I've probably watched it three times since then. So it's a it's a go to for me. I I really enjoy this movie. So it's got good rewatch value for you. Oh, absolutely. What makes you come back to it? It's a well, maybe it's because I've seen part of it is because I've seen it so much. So it's something I can kind of just turn on and and watch and then do something and then come back and keep watching. And it's got some scenes that I thought were just awesome for the the time. I particularly like Vietnam War movies. Um, not any more than any other, but this is kind of a a go-to genre for me when I'm just trying to figure out something to watch. I like the addition of the uh, getting to know his soldiers piece to the beginning of this movie um, in reference to the book where it really doesn't go into character development of, of his, uh, his staff. So um, yeah, I mean, anytime you have something like this, I've even used this movie to uh, exercise to in the same way that, you know, anything with uh, some sort of boot camp can get you going. It does. It does. And for me, this is my first time to it. I, I love it when the show takes me to a movie I haven't seen before, especially when I'm getting to do it with friends who have uh, who love this movie. And uh, somehow it slipped through the cracks for me. I don't always get to combat movies or military movies. I don't know why that is. I just don't get to them as quickly. And sometimes they slip through the cracks. And this is one that did. I completely forgot about its existence, to be honest with you. And so when it came up, I was kind of eager to see this movie. And I got to say, I like this. I, I think that 
there's a lot of differences over a lot of the other ones that I've seen. I might not have seen as many as you two guys have, so it'll be interesting to do a comparison on that as we move forward. But I did enjoy this one. You know, it's a heavy movie, and then I have a harder time rewatching uh, a movie like this. But I'm definitely, I always feel like this is a good thing. It's, uh, it's the story is definitely one that's worth knowing. And it really makes you appreciate, like I said, the fact that it's all based in reality. So, no further ado, there will be spoilers that lie ahead, and we'll be back after these messages. Look to your green leaves, I will make you into soldiers. Now raise your bags at arm's length from your body, chest height until I say so, and keep them up. What is this, Private Cottrell? Is this a non-issued army belt around your waist? Uh, maybe, sir. What makes you think that you can walk in here like that? Did you just forget? What else did you forget, Private Cottrell? Did you equip your latest episode of Retro Movie Roundtable? Yes, Drill Sergeant, sir. Private, did you give Retro Movie Roundtable rating, review, and subscription? Uh, drop here and give me 40, maggot. Don't you know the Retro Movie Roundtable needs your ratings, reviews, subscriptions to build this army of movie lovers and let them know how they can make the show better. I bet you did not even like the show on Facebook, much less write the show at Retro Movie Roundtable at yahoo.com. Uh, no, sir. Are you dead, soldier? Do you think that you're special? I will whip you into shape. I will show you how to dress, rate, review, subscribe, like, and write the show like a United States soldier. Yes, sir, drill sergeant, sir. And we're back. Last warning, there will be spoilers that lie ahead. So, Tyler, why don't you refresh people at home who have not seen We Were Soldiers since 2002? This movie recreates the Battle of the I Drink Valley, Vietnam, in November 1965, fought by the men of the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment. This battle stands out not only because it had enormous political, strategic, and tactical repercussions, but also due to the extraordinary heroism of the soldiers of 17 Cav and its legendary leader, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore. The movie begins by showing first of its kind air mobile unit stood up and began training. Lieutenant Colonel Moore spends a lot of time evaluating his officers and NCOs and shares some of his leadership lessons with them. Training for the soldiers must be tough and realistic as the unit knows there's a high likelihood of deploying and fighting in Vietnam in the near future. Lieutenant Colonel Moore also focuses on developing a relationship with his Huey pilots, which pays dividends during the battle. He also prepares himself for the upcoming battle by studying the mistakes of the French army fighting in Vietnam in the 1950s. Moore is resolved to not let his battalion befall the same fate as neither the unit's predecessor in George Custer, nor the French's massacre on the same train in Vietnam. The first half of the movie also has a lot of character development, such as with Sergeant Major Plumley, the senior enlisted advisor of the time. During this time frame, Julie Moore and the other wives of the key leaders in the unit work together as the Army lifestyle affects their families. As the unit prepares to leave for Vietnam, Lieutenant Colonel Moore makes a pre-deployment speech in which he swears that not a single man will be left on the battlefield, dead or alive. The battle at LZ X-Ray rages nearly constantly for three days and two nights from November 14th to the 16th. The 450 men of 17 Cav drop into a small clearing in the Idring Valley where they are immediately surrounded by 2,000 North Vietnamese soldiers. One of the first platoons on the ground separates themselves from the rest of the unit by chasing after a North Vietnamese scout and is subsequently cut off. This maneuver kills or injures over half the platoon and drives a number of tactical necessities during the remainder of the battle. Throughout the desperate fight, the battalion perimeter is either nearly or actually breached and the unit is only able to hang on due to precise and timely aerial bombing, regular artillery, air rocket artillery, and organic mortars. In addition to overwhelming numbers, Lieutenant Colonel Moore and his battalion face a number of challenges. While casualties were certainly expected, they mount up much quicker than expected, and the medevac birds refused to land in a hot LZ under enemy fire, which was the policy in Vietnam at the time. There's not always enough ammunition and food, and never enough water or medical supplies. Higher headquarters continually request Lieutenant Colonel Moore to leave the battlefield for debriefings. Two Hueys are shot down during the battle on the landing zone. And Lieutenant Colonel Moore and Sergeant Major Plumley are always trying to maintain accountability of not only where their platoons are on the battlefield, but also which soldiers are being evacuated to the rear. The movie also highlights the story of intrepid reporter Joe Galloway, who voluntarily joined the battle in order to tell the story. His pictures and articles increased awareness of the gritty reality of the Vietnam War to all Americans. Simultaneous to what is happening in the jungles of Vietnam, the movie explores the battle on the home front in Fort Benning, Georgia. 
The army is not prepared for the, the transition to full-scale war, and the spouses of the soldiers pay the price. Notification of the soldiers' death are callously delivered by cab drivers as an ordinary telegram message. Julie Moore takes charge of the situation and begins personally notifying each of the families of their soldiers' ultimate sacrifice. The movie concludes with 1-7 Cav leaving LZ X-Ray with both sides feeling that they have won. From the American perspective, the North Vietnamese Army lost significantly more casualties, indicating a U.S. victory. The North Vietnamese, however, gained valuable knowledge of American tactics and knew that they would be able to fight off the Americans long enough until they gave up, just like the French did. Well done. Nice. And succinct. We appreciate that. And uh, so one of the things that made me think about this in a different way than perhaps other military movies had made me think of, I always get caught up maybe in the overall impact of history, looking back on what did they accomplish or what was, why were they there, the intent. And something that maybe I incorrectly thought about was, um, you know, how maybe politics goes out the window when you actually go out there and it's not about the reason that you're there it's more about the people who are next to you uh that was a message that this movie was putting out there tyler is that uh is that something that you feel like uh is 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 actually more realistic to the um the unit yeah that's 100 percent correct and that's not just the the unit but you know battles in general i will say on that note though that i don't feel like the movie did a good job representing how uh, politically impactful this battle was. This was the first pitched battle between uh, North Vietnamese and the U.S. Army as the Army was transitioning out of a uh, advisory role to uh, Viet, uh, South Vietnam and into more of a decisive campaign. So that was a, a pretty big deal and um, one reason why the, the battle is so famous. Yeah, they really they they have like a screenshot of Lyndon B. Johnson talking mm-hmm. to the Union about why we're going over there, but if you weren't there at the time, if you didn't do your history well enough, you could get a little bit lost and that this is the very beginning of it. Oh, I'll also plug that uh, uh, in addition to the book being a valuable resource about this battle and what was going on, I also highly recommend Ken Burns' documentary, The Vietnam War. I learned more about the Vietnam War recently from watching that documentary than all the books or information I'd read on it in the past. He makes a good documentary, so that uh, makes good sense. I'd like to check that out. I haven't seen that yet. Tyler, one of the uh, things, I know military men move around a lot and they get reassigned and they go uh, to new places all the time. How long does it take to form that kind of bond? Because this movie, to me, I think the power of this movie was in the bond that the soldiers form with each other and I'm wondering how do you do that when you're constantly changing where you are but not only that but you're changing who you're around so rapidly what is the what is the ingredients that make that chemistry that is so important uh, to surviving and succeeding how does that come together yeah great question Russell so in the movie there's a, a scene where the different platoons are marching up the the big mountain in Georgia and one platoon leader is doing foot checks and uh, Colonel Moore comments on that another platoon leader is just screaming at his soldiers to go faster and uh, exercises like that is how you build that kind of camaraderie obviously the type of leadership you have can impact whether that camaraderie is uh, or how well it's developed but that shared struggle and being out in the field and uh, training and practicing for days on end is is the best way to build that camaraderie so just going through the grind together then uh, galvanizes you then huh absolutely interesting uh, again for for your normal workers out there you just don't you i guess you're not exposed to that kind of uh, stress working in your your cubicle or working on your computer or whatever so uh that that is that is interesting so this has 400 men at, after the enemy is uh, eliminates the uh, north vietnamese attackers despite the fact that uh, the intelligence has no idea the number of enemy troops uh, from having done uh, the Black Hawk Down episode, we again see the price of going in undermanned. And is that something that, again, I'm not as up to date on my military history. Is this notion of knowing what you're getting in for, is that 
uh, a luxury that you so often don't have? Or do they make movies about that specifically because that's the worst thing and that's the bad case scenario? Well, I think it's kind of two different questions. First of all, the Manning, um, a lot of that was due to the draft policy at the time. And they really didn't have control over when the draftees were going home. These days, we have better prediction of when soldiers are going to end their enlistment and can uh, drive our, our deployment numbers you know, uh, to accommodate for that. And then as far as the intelligence of the enemy, they, the, the 17 Cav was essentially on a what we call a movement to contact. They uh, were just told, go find the enemy. They got a little bit of intelligence from a, a previous attack and then just uh, flew into what we know as LZ X ray to literally find the enemy. So they had an indication that there was a headquarters there, but had no idea to the extent of uh, how big the unit was. So it's like landing right next to a giant hornet's nest and not realizing it, I guess. Essentially, yes. Yeah. So, Brian, as a fan of books and uh, someone who's read this book, what are some of the similarities or, I should say, differences between the book and the movie? Um, I think that based on when I had read the book versus seeing the movie the previous time, I thought it kept pretty close to it until the very end. It's hard with a movie like this where it is predominantly climax from, call it 25% in, to the end, and still have an even bigger climax, and that's where they stretched the most truth uh, to the point of that never happened. So really, the, the, the most damning thing about the movie in terms of the book size would be the bayonet charge, which was completely outdated maneuver at that point. Uh, never would have been... Uh, ordered at that point on was completely fictitious. Huh, I did not realize that. Uh, Tyler, what about you? you? You've also read the book as well. What were your takeaways in the comparing and contrasting the movie to the book? Well, first of all, I agree that it, it kind of got worse uh, as far as compared to the book as the movie went on. The other big gap is that the battle with 17 Cav is only half of the book. So one thing the movie leaves out, and I understand why, but it leaves out that as 17 Cav was leaving the battlefield, really two other battalions were coming into LZ X-Ray to take over the lines. Those two battalions then essentially the enemy was decimated from Colonel Moore and his uh, unit. So those two battalions that were on LZU X-ray then had nowhere or, you know, nothing to fight. So they're ordered to march on elsewhere. And one of those battalions, as they're marching to their next objective, came under a big ambush. They were pretty much cut up by company. And that battle also rages for a couple of days and is the second half of the book. So I understand that a movie can't cover all of those days and all of those characters, but that, it's a pretty big discrepancy. Absolutely. So the whole conflict takes place over three days? Uh, the part of the movie, yes. Question, and they don't establish this in the movie. Maybe they do in the book, and maybe you can answer this, Tyler. Do they sleep, or do you actually, like, or is it just, are you, like, does adrenaline carry you for, like, three straight days? They don't sleep, and Colonel Moore talks a lot about that in the book. Adrenaline is part of it, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure in certain laws they're going to nod off, but when it's life or death, you know, you're, you're going to stay awake. Yeah, I've, I've, I've wondered, I don't know what the limit is. I've personally, I think 48 hours is probably the longest I've personally ever done. So I, I don't know when, when your body shuts down, not to mention when you're exposed to such stressful conditions. I don't know if adrenaline runs out and then you're just like, boop, you know, pass out. Yeah, and it's pretty much impossible to recreate those that scenario. Yeah, I, I assume they don't train you by having you stay up for three days straight. Not most trainings, no. Yeah. So the uh, new cavalry unit was a big part of this. I, I'm not, again, up to my military technology as much, but it's my understanding that the Vietnam War was the first time that they were fighting with by dropping off the soldiers onto the ground, which I guess was a more mobile way of fighting where they could drop people into the right places quickly. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Tyler? 
Yeah, sure. So helicopters have been around, but as with any new technology, it kind of takes a little while to adjust to their military applications. And so the Army had been experimenting with it actually all through 1964 at Fort Benning, uh, doing a bunch of tests and kind of figuring out how they could incorporate it into battle. And so 1-7 CAV was stood up to um, take those lessons learned and apply them to the battlefield. And then it's, you know, ubiquitous throughout all Vietnam battles that we know of, for the most part. Is that something that is still resembles to what you do today, or have things changed dramatically since then? No, it, it absolutely still happens. Air assaults, we call them air, or air assaults now, and it's still fairly common, yes. Okay. So what things have changed that you saw in this movie that you don't see anymore? Tough question is obviously, you know, the different conflicts uh, bring different tactics and, and you know, uh, required rules of engagement. I can think of one offhand. Go ahead, Ron. The use of napalm. Yeah, and white phosphorus grenades. That's a good point. Yeah. What is a white phosphorus grenade? Dumb question. So it, it was used a couple of times uh, in the movie, and it it's a explosive doesn't go out uh, with water, and so it will just continue to burn into your body um, as it sits on your skin. Ooh, that sounds rough. The uh, the cut off platoon has one used against it. Uh, That's right. Where you see the where you see the the fellow soldier trying to basically cut the guy's cheek off to remove it. I was wondering his, what that was. Okay. That, yeah, that's... yeah, that's. A... So so he's cutting so he's cutting into his face to get it off of him. But that's the only way you're going to be able to treat it. Right. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, that sounds awful. So so basically, both both of those two weapons are now. Um, I don't know how to put this, Tyler. Maybe you can help me out. But uh, illegal in civilized warfare is that a good way to put it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And is bayon- are bayonets also on that list? Because Brian was saying you're saying n- no to that anymore as well. No, no. There's we just not a point in it, really. Okay. We, we absolutely still have bayonets. Okay. I guess just to just to clarify what I meant was uh, the ordering of a bayonet charge like that in that scenario in a time of automatic weapons is a a wildly outdated technique. Oh, because it's not a it's, smart it's, thing to do. Right. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Learn. I'm learning all kinds of things on this. This is pushing me to new new areas. This is great. Uh, uh, on on the technology front, another difference is what's called in the book air rocket artillery, or what you'll see the Hueys that are armed with the different rockets and automatic weapons. Nowadays, we have Apaches that kind of do that type of mission, and so we and we don't have Hueys at all. So a little bit different, but a lot of the same effects. I did have a question. Why are we not seeing any larger vehicles like armored vehicles or like tanks or anything of that nature in warfare like this? Just can't get them into that territory? Yeah, you can't drive a tank through the jungle. Got it. So in an effort to draw parallels to, to last year's, would you say that the Black Hawk has, is today's Huey? Yes, for the most part, it, it is the medium-sized troop carrier. Uh, they had Chinooks in uh, Vietnam, and actually some Chinooks picked up soldiers as they were leaving LZ X-Ray, uh, and we still use Chinooks today. Is the firepower that they're using similar to what we use today, like the, the rifles and you know those things? Uh, similar. I mean, we've moved on from the, they had the very basic model M16. We've gone through four or five evolutions of M16 onto the M4 now, but it's still the same caliber bullet. Yeah. A few other changes, large magazines and the M60 machine gun was their, their primary automatic weapon. And again, we have the same uh, size caliber um, machine gun, but it's a, uh, in 240 so it's a little bit lighter and, and better in a lot of ways interesting and on that note of magazine and, am- and ammo i think something that was alluded to in this and i'm sure there's a lot more to it is uh the the, tr- the challenge of uh keeping supply of ammo i would think in these situations where you're so grossly outnumbered and you're, you're ever pressing and you're counting on helicopter shipments to come in 
how much when you're fighting or when you're training, how do you possibly hold on to your ammo? Because I know the only thing that I can even think of is like, you know, paintball video games or whatever. You would just blow through your ammo constantly all the time. So when it's real and you have to hold on to it because you need to make sure that it's there. But on the other hand, you have to eliminate a threat. What's that like? Well, you'll see even in the movie, every time that Major Crandall or the other Hughes come in after the the initial delivery of all of the soldiers they're bringing boxes of ammo and so in this case it was you know in some ways nice that they weren't marching around so they're able to just to drop off the ammo and then distribute it otherwise you're you know you're humping it on your back i mean the guys who are cut off though i mean the, in particular i think that's what i'm thinking of like you're cut off you can't get back to your to your friendlies so mm -hmm. well that's that's kind of where you see, I mean, Sergeant Savage at one point says, conserve your ammo, one shot, one kill. Um, and then he's pretty much down to just marching artillery in right on top of them and not using bullets at all. Exactly. Again, back to the adrenaline comment. Uh, for me, that that was the part of the movie that put me on the most edge. And really, uh, that was the part that really resonated with me the most. I mean, there was a lot going on. But this movie did a good job of keeping track of that, I thought. so. But I was always most interested. I, was, that was the ridge, as they were calling it, where they were cut off, right? No, it was the, the Lost Platoon. The ridge was a different company. Okay. Or I think they may have called it the Knoll. But, the Knoll, um, okay. Wh yeah. While we were talking about Sergeant Savage... We talked a lot about how the book was different. I wanted to hit on at least one way where the, the book was similar, or one example of how the, the book was well represented by the movie. Once the Lost Platoon is rescued by the rest of Bravo Company, they just kind of lie there, and Captain Nadal says, hey, are you guys still out here? And Sergeant Savage just barely raises his hand. This is, this is what actually happened as the Lost Platoon um, did not get up when they were rescued and they just uh, continued to lie there and actually encouraged the rest of the company they're like get down you know lie down and get flat because you're about to get shot and they're like no we have overwhelming force now we're okay like come on we're rescuing you and it took some convincing to get them back to uh, friendly lines so that's just one example of of you know how the movie did do a good job of representing what actually happened yeah, and Brian, what about you? Were, are there any other? We we talked a lot about the differences and how they're not the same. Are there any big victories that you were seeing book to movie? I mean, I I pretty much focused on really how they laid out the battle, how the troop deployments that Moore was doing from LZ X Ray to how he dispersed them everywhere and that sort of thing. I didn't nitpick too much on basically names and who is where, but that was an excellent tidbit. You could tell that a writer was going through the book and said, this right here, this will make compelling film. Absolutely. How more respected the Army's commanders of the Vietnamese. Uh, he, uh, the actual man was in some of the interviews, and uh, he lived until 2017, so he had a chance to see this movie when it came out and talk about it afterwards. And he mentioned how much he, I guess, respected Lieutenant Colonel Neogu Yin uh, Huan, which is the Vietnamese tactician going up against him. He was saying that he fought wars his entire life. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this movie is they show you a little bit more of a glimpse of the other side. That's not something I've seen a lot of, and if they do, they always just make them seem like bad guys, good guys. This movie somewhat humanizes the other side. What was your take on that one, uh, Brian? Uh, you should watch Letters from Iwo Jima first off. That is almost completely the other side. Yes, absolutely. It's not something you get to see a whole lot in uh, movies. I had read somewhere that the initial idea of writing this was not just a hats off to our guys, but also for how hard they fought as well. Whether or not that accomplished its mission or not is is probably the latter. No, no, you're you're not you're not wrong. Uh, this is one of the few movies that gives you a little bit of uh, a taste of the other side, and you know they were. They were all people fighting for what they believed in, too. I thought that was pretty unique about this movie. I don't know if... Uh, what were your thoughts on when you saw the Vietnamese side, Tyler? Well, two things on this. One, one of the main reasons this is possible to look at it from their side is how more later, I'm not sure exactly which year, uh, but he met with Lieutenant Colonel and then Lieutenant General on, and they talked about the battle. So this is years after the Vietnam War, or decades after the Vietnam War, it's over, and they, they met up and, and discussed the whole thing. 
So that gives us interesting perspective. And then another thing is uh, I read that there were actually some extras in the movie that had been in the North Vietnamese army. Uh, so that was an uh, interesting take as well. That is really surprising. Another thing that I thought was really interesting about this movie is there's a lot of perspective about what's going on back home with the families of the people who are at war. And I thought that that was a really powerful part of this movie where it showed the toll that war really, really takes on those back home and that uh, these people have families and that, you know, you see soldiers in a war movie, but uh, those soldiers are fathers and sisters, brothers, and more than any other military movie I've seen uh, thus far. Maybe Private Ryan at the beginning has a very poignant moment at the beginning, but it's early in the movie. that This really... Hit, that hit home for me. I don't know what were your, what was your take on that? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's an important part of any a unit of any battle. It's distracting if you're deployed and things aren't going right at home. Uh, a lot due to the mistakes that the army made. Uh, nowadays we have whole systems in place to make sure that nobody's notified by a telegram or an email. These days, find out by Facebook. That would just be the worst. Um, so we have. People identified and trained uh, to do these kind of notifications a lot because of how we messed it up in, in the 60s. Yeah, I, I, I was really down by that. Just a taxi cab driver coming up and handing you a letter. That seemed that seemed yeah. crazy almost. Like you said, uh, you'd think that somebody would at least be, uh, I guess, adept at dealing with this. I will say that I'll give a nod. The guy who plays that taxi driver... That's actually a really heartbreaking scene, both from from uh, Ju- Julie Moore's standpoint and the taxi driver, where he's just like, "I I don't want to be doing this. Like this is like the worst thing I can imagine doing today, and here I am doing it." And then the from Julie Moore's standpoint, thinking that a she's gonna get a telegram saying her husband's dead, and then her assuming the responsibility of you know she should be the one or is going to be the one who's going to be giving that bad news over and over again yeah and he's wearing a, a surplus army jacket which i think is an indication like and he's older so he's like this probably like, guy was probably in world war ii he knows how terrible this whole situation is but that's what he's you know his job for the day so Ooh, yeah yeah delivering bad news is never good so that is the worst of it too and one thing that this movie they at the end they kind of show the uh, vietnam uh, mm-hmm. memorial and that was kind of nice. I, I sometimes feel like the soldiers from Vietnam aren't celebrated, held up as because it's it's not a it's not a war where we really want it. I think that this movie made some gesture towards that, but I thought I, I, as towards the end of the movie, I really thought that there was a need to call out that it, they are underappreciated. If that makes sense. Yeah, and I I think most Americans would agree with you. Uh, I think we've, as a American you know, psyche, we have uh, done a much better job of separating the soldiers and the you know, service members overall from the political decision making, and I think that's you know done done us uh, huge favors in the past couple of decades. A movie like this really makes me stop and think about that again like i said so so often in history class it's all about whatever the political leaders that wanted to do what did they accomplish and you know the the tarnished legacy of what our intentions were in vietnam at the time but you, you, when you watch a movie like this and particularly one that's so much about their families and their their kinship with each other in that unit that to me really hits home of like it's not about any of that to those soldiers it's about that they're there making an enormous sacrifice and it's huge huge uh service that they're still serving whether or not the leader who put them in that position or not made a good call or not i feel like those soldiers should absolutely get the respect that they deserve and so this was one of those movies where like i said i don't know how you phrase that i don't know if you write a black screen with white text on it at the end but somehow that's the distinguishing lingering feeling that i want to make sure people walk away with on this one so Oh, sorry. I was just going to say the interesting thing for me on this is I don't know if it's generational or what, but I feel like my whole basis of knowledge on Vietnam growing up was that it was a basically a disrespected war from the home population that shouldn't have been. So I grew up hearing this message. So I never, I never got the the disrespect standpoint from this i only heard the message that was 
that things like this or even tidbits on like an episode episode of the X Files or something because because Skinner was in Vietnam. Like there was just there were parts in pop culture all through the late eighties and nineties saying th- th- it was wrong how soldiers were treated in this. So I feel like just for me personally at, at the age I'm I'm at, it never I never got a negative view of Vietnam as as it was lived, or at least as the home population was living it, I only got the, this should be wildly respected because it was underappreciated in terms of our troops at the time. Does that make sense? I wish that were more the case, but I think there's just so many stories of people being, or soldiers who come back being either overlooked or uh, even in some cases, even harassed in some cases, uh, which, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's a wide variety there, but I mean, also in terms of just caring for those veterans who came back after that war, it just wasn't, you know, World War II was a smashing success. We all came home, we won the war, and, you know, those people wore that like a badge of honor for the rest of their lives. Maybe you said, like, maybe history's, perhaps right at that but i you just know that it wasn't that way for them oh no no no. so maybe it, you misunderstood me on this i totally i mean pop culture bears out how bad this was for our troops coming home that's that's overwhelmingly visible but the visibility of it was in an effort to me like the message being sent for everything i can remember from early years of vietnam the message being sent was this was a disservice. This was a wrong visited upon the troops. And that everything you should think about this is, you know, they were troops fighting for you. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I just, I, I do feel like the, the wide range, the message that was sent from at some, I can't say exactly which point on was don't make the mistake that had been made. That's fair. You, you were going to say something on that note, Tyler. Oh, I was just going to say that not to mention the most of these soldiers were draftees and still, you know, working hard and sacrificing and accomplishing the mission. Oh, good point. Is there a favorite war that you enjoy uh, reading about in particular? Mm, No, what I'm trying to do right now actually is keep it varied. I just bought another World War II book, which I was trying to avoid, but I want to make sure that I'm learning a little bit about Vietnam, a little bit about Korea, World War II, not to forget World War I. I'm a bu- around a bunch of in a Civil War battlefields, so I'm going to see those and um, and then occasionally dabbling into you know international wars that had nothing to do with us. So I would rather I feel like I can glean more lessons to apply later by not focusing in on one warm war. Do you ever go back as far as like the Revolutionary War, eighteen twelve, or, or like the Civil War, or is that just too too far removed from what's of interest to you now? I don't know a single person that studies the War of eighteen twelve. Well, it's a but... very navy battle. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I don't. Th- yeah, that <laughs> good point. But um, yeah, because there are. That's why people still study Sun Tzu, right? He he wrote thousands of years ago. There are timeless lessons that you can learn. The element of surprise, right? You, it's applied differently whether you're in ancient Greece or in Afghanistan uh, today. But the element of surprise is still, you know, essential. Or, of course, leadership is an obvious one because mm-hmm. leadership traits and uh, techniques can be applied to any person so there aren't many times that you're like well that's just completely outdated and i can't do anything with that information that's a great attitude and a good outlook on it i feel the same way in architecture greatly different thing but i find that all eras are of interest even if i might not like the way things have gone in a certain era i learn from things even like i said i learned from things that didn't go well in those eras yeah well, roman so. roman uh roman columns and gothic arches still have to hold buildings up right so absolutely you know old lessons come back classic line is history does repeat itself so yeah i just read mattis's book the former secretary of defense and he does an awesome job of just like his book is nothing about being secretary of defense it's all about his marine career he does an awesome job of being like, I was in Iraq, and here's a quote from Grant that really, you know, applied to the situation, or, you know, whatever time frame in his career, he's able to 
intermix all the lessons learned. He's uh, famous for just being super well read. Brian, why don't you give us a cast rundown here? Okay, I want to be very judicious here because I have a lot of tidbits that go into this in our later segments. So I'm going to go over the top 10, and then uh, if you feel like working some other people in there with any of your other segments, then go ahead and do it. So we're starting with Mel Gibson as Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, Madeline Stowe as Julie Moore, Greg Kinnear as Major Bruce Snake, it's not his full tag, but Snake uh, Crandall, Sam Elliott as Sergeant Major Basil Plumley. Chris Klein as 2nd Lieutenant Jack Gohagen. Carrie Russell as Barbara Gohagen. Barry Pepper as Joe Galloway. Duong Don as Lieutenant Cur- Colonel Noyan Huan. Ryan Hurst as Sergeant Ernie Savage. You said Colonel Nguyen Huan so much better than me, and now I'm going to say it like you because uh, I, got, <laughs> I got to that first. It's like, probably oh, still wrong, too. That's, that's the worst, yeah. man. I Nothing makes me feel worse in our podcast than the many many names i probably butcher so oh man i got to i got to that one first and i was just like i clearly have not said this out loud and i'm <laughs> go on <laughs> uh robert bagnell is first lieutenant charlie hastings i'm gonna kind of saw off there but there are uh many other famous people not so much then, but now that uh, I've I've got worked into other segments, so I'm just gonna to draw the line there. I gotta say, one of the most colorful characters in this is Sam Elliott's portrayal of Sergeant Major Basil Plumley. Tyler, is this a real type of person that you will encounter in the military? Is is there really somebody this grumpy? A hundred percent. He is a living stereotype of what we expect out of our command sergeant majors. So. It's so it's common major. then. He is he is also hands down my favorite character in this movie, by far. What you'll notice, and it, it's portrayed a little bit in the movie, but sergeants major are are grumpy on the outside, but all they do is care about the soldiers and making sure that the soldiers are taken care of. Uh, this is not a movie with many laughs, but I did laugh at the good moments, like. Nice day outside, isn't it? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you know what kind of goddamn day it is? <laughs> yep. I was like, oh man, that. Uh... I would say that I have probably sought out more Sam Elliott movies than other actors based on movies like this. Like, I even watched The Man Who Killed Hitler and then Bigfoot specifically because Sam Elliott's the main character. I'm like, yep, sign me up. <laughs> you know, he's hard to recognize with that, that gigantic mustache he has. He's in the Mustache Hall of Fame. I loved him and thank you for smoking. I never even smoke Marlboros. I smoke cools. If you make a mustache Mount Rushmore, there's no way he's not on it. I mean, it's Tom Selleck, Sam Elliott. I don't know who the other two are, but... Uh, those are definitely... Burt uh, Reynolds, man. Oh, Burt yep. Reynolds. Burt Reynolds is on the... Tyler, who's, who's another mustache on the Mount Rushmore of mustaches? I'd have to think about that. I, I think... Uh, I don't know if they were all fake, so if they if any of these were fake, I will back down. But I have to say, Kurt Russell's got to have a, a pretty serious mustache a time or two. Time or two. Teddy Roosevelt's got a pretty, pretty famous mustache. I got it. Hulk Hogan. Oh, that's a good oh, one. Oh, that's... Yeah, Fu Manchu. There that's, you go. That's he's got a rarity. I mean, that's that's not a common mustache either. That completes our Mount Rushmore of mustaches. Tangent complete. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mel Gibson and the actors actually did a, a lightweight two week celebrity boot camp to help prepare them for the movie. He said uh, it was nowhere near as hard as what the troops actually do. But uh, I always find it fun when an actor gets a chance to commit two full weeks of time to do something like this. So. Tyler, if you had to get somebody off the street, let's say a generic actor walks in the door tomorrow. Chris Pine walks in the door and says, you got to make me seem like I can uh, walk the walk and talk the talk. What are you doing? Oh, uh, that'd be a lot of fun. I mean, that's that's our whole concept of basic training, right, is breaking somebody down so you can build them back up. Yeah, so it'd be a, a lot of what we call um, getting smoked and just doing lots of push-ups and uh, other exercises um, which are physically exhausting, which then, you know, makes it uh, mentally challenging, um, even kind of simple tasks. And then, um, 
you know, a lot of, I'd spend some time on the range, getting used to the weapon systems, and um, probably throwing some ruck marches in there, so extra challenged. Actually, sounds like a pretty interesting experience to have. Yeah, come, come on down, and uh, I'll put you through two weeks. Uh, I, that sounds like the gym membership, uh, a great deal for a gym membership. So. <laughs> uh, did so, it, so it's actually interesting you bring that up. There have been multiple times where if I didn't have a full-time job, I was like, you know, if I ever have some off time, I would love to go through some sort of basic training, not just for the, like, the definition, like the uh, training aspect of it is also awesome. Like, I would like to learn how to do certain things that I'm sure they cover in basic. I'm just thinking Brian's sitting there in his head going, grenades, grenades, grenades. <laughs> Can we do grenades? Well, I mean, sure, but no, not just that, but like wilderness survival, basically just taking care of yourself if there's no one else around, That just stuff like that. I, f- I feel like there's a lot of information. One of the interesting characters in this we haven't talked about yet is Joe Galloway. My first thought was, this is incredibly unrealistic. This guy's just going to hop on a helicopter. Everybody's okay with it. like having a, a news reporter or a journalist just go out there in the middle of nowhere unarmed. I mean, he's just going to get in the way. And then the next thing you know, the uh, general's talking to him. But I guess this did happen. I don't know if you can give me any insights on that from uh, you guys as book readers, but uh, that's... That just, again, that seems like a place of uh, serious business. Uh, I can't believe they brought him out there. Yeah, it absolutely happened, and he was the only one that you know was there for the majority of the battle, and you know that's the only way to get news then, and to some degree, the only way to get news now. There, there are reporters out doing similar things uh, these days. So I just found it pretty wild that uh, he went out there with a camera in the middle of all that stuff. I don't know. I'd want a rifle, not a camera, in that situation. So. Well, he had that too. <laughs> but the first modern war correspondent uh, was a Dutch painter named Willem van de Velde, and he uh, he took to the sea in nineteen uh, sorry sixteen fifty three uh, in a small boat to observe a naval battle between the Dutch and the English. That sounds way safer than this. <laughs> uh, uh, if not you, necessarily. If you take it, yeah, if you could, if you take into uh, uh, how naval battles went back then. Uh, that'd be pretty bad. <laughs> Those cannons weren't necessarily dialed in on, you know, exact GPS coordinates. Splintering, splintering wood. If you, if, if you have time to paint, though, if you can set us, if you can set up an easel and like in your little stool and, and paint, uh, then I'm assuming that you have a lot longer of a window to sit there being safe than uh, when than what Joe Galloway got. I, I imagine, just imagine walking out into this particular conflict and saying like, "I'm gonna paint." No. Uh, I, I said he was a painter. I didn't say he was he was necessarily painting the battle. He oh, watched the battle and then painted okay. it later. Did not realize that part. <laughs> he didn't go out to paint the battle in his boat. Okay. <laughs> I, w- I was imagining something like Mel Brooks from like, you know, History of the World Part 1 where he's like, okay, guys, I need everybody to face the painting. All right. Okay. Well, that's on me. Dennis Leary was considered to play the role of uh, Bruce Crandall instead of Greg Kinnear. I don't like this a possibility as a casting. I like Greg Kinnear, and I can't imagine Dennis Leary bring, I guess, the shaken, sincere quality to it. He's uh, just too angry all the time. I, I can't picture this. I think he would have done fine, but the scene where he confronts the medevac uh, company commander, Robert I think Den- Dennis Leary would have overacted. Yeah, I think they made a good call with Kinnear on this one. And hey, John Hamm is in this. He set a goal giving himself that he would give it a go until the age of 30 to land a role in a feature film before he would just give up working as an actor and, you know, go on with real life, us for mere mortals out here. And uh, turns out he landed this feature film at age 30. He's in Mad Men and other several other good movies as a result of it. So uh, made it at the last minute. Yeah, I'm a huge John Hamm fan. He was, he was one of the guys I had earmarked to mention that... If you take the time, and maybe this is comes from watching a lot, you start to notice people, and then as time goes on, you start to start to notice people and who they became. And I just thought that was a cool thing. Uh, and I'll I'll just toss it out there now since we're talking about it. But Clark Gregg, who goes on to play Agent Coulson, is in this as Captain Tom Metzger. Yeah, and so I was watching this again for this podcast and i was like oh my god i completely forgot colson's in this so it, you start as people become more prominent in the roles that they play now you get to go back and watch something like this and be like wow this cast was stacked that is that is a fun 
little thing. You're right, and I kept expecting John Hamm's character to do more, but you're right. He just John Hamm was nobody at that point. He was John who? I'm not sure which came out first, just because I don't have the date right in front of me, but uh, the guy who played Savage, I really like him too. He went on to be uh, probably most notably in Remember the Titans, but he was also in the first uh, season and a half or two seasons of Sons of Anarchy, and he was one of my favorite characters in both of those, whether it was due to this movie or maybe if I saw Titans first and I liked him better in this, but one way or the other, he he was one of my favorite guys. I I love Remember the Titans, and I I, I like him for that movie, too. And uh, another person I like is Taylor Momsen. I know her from the band The Pretty Reckless. She's awesome, but she was actually a kid actor. You might know her as Cindy Lou Who from The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. She is one of Mel Gibson's children in this movie. She's not the one who gets all the uh, cute uh, lines like talking to her dad stuff, so she's one of the quieter kids, but she's in there as well, so look for her. Yeah, so, so remember the Titans was 2000. So I saw Titans first and then this. So yeah, that makes sense. Tit- tit- Titans boosted uh, Hearst's credit for me. Yeah. The director of this movie is Randall Wallace. He doesn't have a huge backlog of film uh, films under his belt. This is one of four movies that he directs, the others being The Man in the Iron Mask, Secretariat, and Heaven is Real. So uh, he he's mostly a writer, and he's written for a number of TV productions. He wrote for Pearl Harbor, another military movie, and he wrote for Braveheart, which is quite a war movie as well, of a different nature. Uh, This is more accurate than Braveheart, though. Yes, I would say so. (laughs) Yeah. What do we think about Randall as a director? Do you think he weaves a good story? Do you think that he keeps the viewer in the right place? And do you think that he's doing a good job of presenting the content that you saw in the book and converting that to film? I'll let you go first, Tyler. Well, I just want to use like one anecdote to, to talk about the storytelling. Kind of in the middle of the movie, they were finishing up a scene at Fort Benning with uh, the families and the wives. And as it's wrapping up, you hear, you start hearing gunfire. Gunfire is fading into the scene, but you're still looking at the neighborhood at Fort Benning. And then it slowly fades into the jungles of Vietnam. And I think it's an excellent way to show how these events that are happening 8,000 miles apart are interconnected and indicative overall of his storytelling ability. That's a good point. That was a a good transition. I thought there were some good transitions, and I thought there were some odd transitions as well, but more good ones than bad ones. And that's, that's definitely one of the good ones. What about you, Brian? What do you think about Randall Wallace and his manning the boat here of this movie production? Um, I have nothing negative to say. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot positive to say either. This this is a perfect example of a movie where the movie did its job. There wasn't anything that stood out, which I was just like, oh my gosh, that blows my mind. This director, wow. But at the same time, there wasn't any glowing inadequacies either. This was one of those, like, shake the guy's hand, say, you did a good job, and move on. Black Hawk Down was a big success, and it had come out the year before. And one of the things that you may recall back when we talked about that episode last year was I struggled with keeping track of what was going on, who was where, what was happening at the moment. And I got to give Randall Wallace credit. There's multiple areas of conflict in this one, just as in that there is in that movie. You're back at base. There's the ridge. There's the creek. There's the knoll. There's the Vietnamese soldiers in the caves. And... I felt like at all points I was oriented and I knew who was in which situation and where and when. And I liked that. That helped me out a lot. That was one of the things that frustrated me going through Black Hawk Down of just like everything's covered in dust. I don't know where any part of this is. Who's next to who? Where, you know, who who can actually, who's safer or with the group and who's cut off? And I just want to give Wallace credit in the actual moment, it's probably pretty chaotic to know what's going on. He helps me as a viewer understand the story by doing it. Is that because the entire thing was labeled for you? Okay. <laughs> that, labels help. That did help. Uh, Here's I, your sign. I, as far as... Uh, it, was just, it was simpler terrain, too, right? So you are you have a mostly open field, and then you have the bad guys surrounding the field. Uh, a lot simpler than multiple you know, city districts. Street districts, yeah. It's true, too. Yeah, this all this all happened on a football field. <laughs> One thing that I was skipping ahead to the location a little bit, though, I mean, like, I was expecting all jungles from Vietnam, but they said in the, inter- or the interviews about in the making of this film 
that this particular conflict uh, takes place in a highlands area of Vietnam, and I was unexpected. I was just surprised to see the grassland, the scrub grass, and the wiry mm-hmm. trees, and not uh, hot, humid jungle, and again the mountainous terrain. So this is a this is a part of the Vietnam War I had no idea about. Well, I think it's it was still hot and humid, and then there were even sections of the subsequent battle uh, the the next day that were in heavier parts of trees. But yeah, like you said, not exactly like uh, jungle. It's true. I could tell it was hot and uh, super hot because uh, I, the pit stains uh, that they put on the general of the mm-hmm. Vietnamese soldier because I couldn't catch his real name. Mary and I were calling him General Pit Stains the whole time because yeah. it was like those are the largest pit stains ever. Yeah. They're even bigger than my math teacher, Mr. Lahotas. <laughs> mm. I remember him. I mean, there are a lot of little tidbits in this that I really enjoyed. I liked the ongoing banter between the Colonel and uh, Plumley, uh, or sorry, uh, is it, yeah, Pump Plumley, about the use of an M16 versus his 45. If you notice, they never have Sam Elliott shooting people from any sort of distance with that which i thought was incredibly accurate like every time you see him using his sidearm he's doing it at extremely close quarters combat which is exactly its effective range is when they're right up on you and i felt like if if you know that about using a sidearm versus using a rifle i feel like that adds to the encroachment value there really wasn't good interior lines for this battle it was all i mean there were holes people were getting through you got the bayonet guy who gets shot in the head and and one of my favorite lines of the movie is mel gebson is like how bad is it how he goes oh it's getting pretty sporty out here so it's like i i felt like those little tidbits added to the feeling of claustrophobia that even the the medical area where they were collecting wounded like that was basically a line (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah and so it just it just added to that suffocation that not only do you have smoke from artillery and mortars and napalm going on you have the actual heat and humidity of the time you have the fact that there are enemies everywhere and just all those things combined they mention water more than once and how awful it would have been for the cutoff platoon because they were out of water because they didn't have much where they were so there were just a lot of things to it that I felt added to the density of the feeling. No, it's a good point. The actors actually did this in chronological order, which is interesting. A lot of movies don't do that, and this movie did do that, and that helps the actors sense that seeing has like the conflicts that arise in this. It helps them emulate the moment that they're in as well, whether it be you know the crisis that they're undergoing and they're trying to pursue. So if I were an actor, I would, I would love that. So I thought that was cool that Wallace did that. It takes more time and usually takes more money. So one of the things I thought was interesting, there was this cutaway that was really odd. In the middle of a battle, they go back to the wives. Most of the other transitions were really smooth, and they had just gone back to base with like Greg Kinnear, and I was like, I was sitting there thinking, like, that was an abrupt shift. I hope they don't do that very often anymore. And then there was another one later on that had to do with Galloway, where that went into his story. But for the most part, this moved right along after the beginning. But man, this thing has a long, long lead in. Tyler, does this movie flow well for you? Uh, I think it flows pretty well. I think the long lead in into the battle was pretty essential to develop the the characters. And just like Brian said at the beginning, I think the movie actually does a better job than the book at developing the the characters to make it, you know, more uh, personable to the the viewer. And going back to what you're you're touching on with a transition with Galloway, I think you're referring to the kind of montage scene that they have with his photos, and it, he's like fading in and out, like taking the photos. I took big issue with that because i didn't feel like it fit into the storyline at all it was also kind of cheesy and then i later read that those weren't even galloway's real photos those were stills from filming the movie so i think that whole part should have been been scrapped it's a good good change one thing thing. yeah if, if you want to show the real photos do that at the credits or at the very end or maybe when they're back in America, you know, and then, you know, the photos as he's sitting there typing on his typewriter. 
and as he's you yeah. know reading what he's writing yeah. then show those photos on the screen and i'm with you show the real photos i just you know those were pictures of the actors so Cre- credits is exactly what i was thinking just have all of galloway's actual photos while the credits are rolling yeah yeah it, 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 it hit me as odd in the movie same thing like you know you're you're, you're at the wives gathering just and like they were in the middle of a firefight and i know like i mean Kinnear had just gone back to base and like had a moment of like you know where he was taking it all in and he vomited it was just too much to take in so cut back to the wives at that point that's that's the time to do that so i don't want to nitpick on him too much because like i said wallace did a lot of good stuff did you notice how often they go to a lot of slow-mos in this i might think even a few too many did they use too many slow motions for you tyler I never thought about it, but, you know, at least they're not all Hollywood, I'm too cool to look at explosions type slow-mo, so. That's a good point. You're right about that. I'll, I'll actually concur with that. I don't I don't think I ever registered that piece. It, it's not like J.J. Abrams with lens flares or something like that, where I'm like, God, they use a lot of lens flares in this. So it wasn't, it wasn't enough to, like, re- like, register in my mind as a overuse of something. You know, they're used for, you know, pointed death scenes and stuff like that, whether it be like the Vietnamese guy who they've gotten you attached to, who's charging with a bayonet, getting shot in the head, or whether it be, Mm. you know, Chris Klein uh, moving in and, you know, he's being, you know, like his death scene, you know, that is somehow in the directorial world, like I had labeled him, this is one of those guys who's going to make it to the end. And when that happened, Mm -hmm. like at like literally the 40% mark in the movie, I was like, did not see that coming. I thought that this movie does a good job of not glorifying war. Uh, a lot of uh, movies uh, sometimes turn them into action movies, I think, which is what you were talking about, Tyler, with like the cool guys don't look at explosion moments. Like yeah. they, you know, when one of the biggest ones to me was when Galloway went to help lift a burned man and mm. uh, the flesh falls off of his legs. And I mean, I know it's movie magic, but boy, uh, that's based on a real thing. And just knowing that that's based on a real thing, ooh, that. That, that was hard. Yeah, it makes your you know, gut kind of wrench no matter who you are. Also, why we don't use napalm anymore. Oh, man. That guy lived for two days afterwards, uh, they said in the interviews. Ugh. Yeah, that's, that's horrible. One thing that I thought didn't belong in this was uh, the whites-only laundromat scene from the 60s. Like, you know, like when they said, like, the laundry only does whites and they don't let you take her colors. And then they said that's, that's black people weren't allowed to go there. I'm sorry. You're in the middle of the civil rights movement. I don't know what part of the country that you're claiming to be from where you might not know that, but that seems like uh, 2000s uh, looking back on it like, hey, we've looked at this very differently. We're going to make the we're going to make everybody uh, look back on that displeasingly like that. Every I think people knew what was going on at that point in time. And it's not a good part of history for that. But that moment, that little piece of history right there, that didn't sit quite right that didn't seem real to me i think if you move you live in california your whole life and they moved to southern georgia for the first time i don't know i wasn't alive then but uh i find it a little bit more believable i just i don't know you you didn't read a newspaper like dr martin luther king jr's like uh you know household name for whatever reason, that one didn't sit as well for me. So, what did you think about the special effects? They did a lot of this with practical effects, uh, and they didn't do a lot of computerization. They, they digitally added a few extra helicopters in there, but many of the helicopters they had were actually real helicopters. And Tyler, what do you think about the aesthetic of the movie? Does it feel real? Yeah, I think it feels very real. I think some of the explosions seemed a little off, but maybe that's just kind of looking at it, you know, from today's standards. But overall, I think they did a great job of making it feel real. You know, they, similar to the the pit stains you're talking about, they get dirtier throughout the movie. And that's not only from laying in the dirt behind cover, but also because the uh, artillery is landing so closely to them that the dirt was spraying them. You'll certainly notice Mel Gibson's eyes become more sunken in and bloodshot throughout the movie because they're uh, like we talked about going on three or four days of sleep one of the companies that went to lz x-ray was on guard duty the night before they flew out there and so they stayed up all night on guard duty and then went into the battle so that i feel was well represented so i i think it was it was gritty and it was supposed to be it was neat to see all, all the in the behind the scenes like how they have uh, these timed pieces that go off and have like air cannons shoot up like 
the soil that represent like uh, ammunition hitting the ground and spraying up the dust and the rocks everywhere. Uh, they they did say uh, the cinematographer was talking about why it was really important to always ha not to have any clean footage because there is nothing clean. It's always going to have smoke and dust and everything flying around at that one point. And he's right. There, you know, it's sunny, but you wouldn't know it because all the stuff's going on. So uh, they they handled it well with lighting. There's a lot of explosions in the background and stuff like that. That uh, there's actually some pretty good uh, lighting with all the, with with those pyrotechnics that they're doing. So and those are real pyrotechnics. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Soundtrack, Brian. What do you think about the soundtrack on this movie? I uh, really liked it. It's kind of one of those one-off in terms of recognizable songs. It's actually part of my best shot uh, is the uh, the chopper dropping to the nap of the earth quote when they start playing the uh, the song Sergeant McKenzie, uh, which is I think probably the primary most recognizable song from the movie. But uh, that whole sequence of the first sixty men going in was was really uh, I mean it's a very I mean, it's written as a ad morium for a, a Vietnam soldier, so I felt it was very practically, you know, Vietnam War sounding. I I want to uh, disagree on that. I have a surprisingly big problem with the soundtrack. So the motto of the Seventh Cavalry is Gary Owen, and you'll hear that in the movie a couple times, and you'll even see the base is named Gary Owen. It's supposed to be one word. You'll see it as two oftentimes. But that was their motto ever since the days of Custer. It was either Custer or sometime in that period that they adopted this Irish uh, tune as their regimental you know, kind of marching song. That song is not in the movie at all, which I was disappointed that they weren't able to tie that in at all. And then um, they do play Sergeant McKenzie a lot, like Brian was just saying. But Gary Owen is a, and it's a small thing, but Gary, Owens, Gary Owen is an Irish tune, and Sergeant McKenzie is actually a Scottish tune, so it seems to, uh, you know, conflict there. I did not know that. Yeah. I'll have to look that song up now. I, one thing that I thought was interesting is the closing music, uh, Mansions of the Lord, has become an unofficial army funeral hymn, and it was used at the recessional of the former President Ronald Reagan's funeral as well. Somber, somber note at the end. Mm-hmm. This is part of the show I like to call Look for This, where we go back and say, is there any interesting trivia or fun facts that didn't necessarily fit into anything else we had done so far? Tyler, do you have any Look for This moments? I do, and I, I tried to, to find my own here, ones that you're not necessarily going to be able to see uh, on the internet. So when Hal Moore comes home at the very end of the movie, he's actually wearing the rank of Colonel, a uh, full bird. Uh, and this is accurate because just within a couple months after the Idring uh, battle, he was promoted and became a brigade commander. So when it says he served another 235 days, uh, most of that was as the brigade commander for the same brigade he was a battalion commander in. So that, that's a pretty cool you know, little detail that they made sure to add in there. The little flag that's blowing... Um, you know, throughout the movie and, and that tree stump. When I first watched it, it was like, well, that's super cheesy Hollywood to have that in there. But after reading the book, that actually happened. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. Also, you can look out for the bugle. It's throughout the battle. It's kind of a, a theme. And you'll notice that when the North Vietnamese massacre that French patrol, they take the bugle from the French. That same bugle was then taken from the North Vietnamese during the I drank battle. And as far as I understand it is still with uh, one seven calf uh, today. And then finally at the, the end of the movie, when Mel Gibson is walking along the Vietnam uh, Memorial wall, the center of the, the frame where it's showing the names is Jack uh, Giggin, the Lieutenant and uh, William Goldball, who he had uh, gone out to try to rescue and uh, ended up sacrificing himself to try to save. So I thought that was pretty, pretty impactful. Excellent ones. And yeah. I, that's, that's neat about the wardrobe in particular. I, I did see in the behind the scenes that they were making a lot of the wardrobe decisions off of original clothes, you know, surplus items and things like that from the sixties specifically. They took a lot of details like whether it be 
the characters talked to the actors talked to a lot of the real people who were there and so like mm -hmm. they found out like i put my wedding ring around my dog tag and so that actor would really do that thing or the, yeah. uh you know the actual uh you know the the baby name on the wrist and stuff like that there are a lot of little details that you don't see in the movie they're not all as major as that either they're very very small and the actors take it pretty seriously and so when they talk to the real people or the wives of the real people they they really got it they took it upon themselves to represent each person in that unit and they acted as a unit to try and represent that i thought that was pretty cool as an ensemble to go to that level of detail so i don't necessarily see all those details but with you pointing that out that shows that they tried to be accurate so that's cool brian look for this uh i hate following that up because those were way more meaningful than mine um, <laughs> <laughs> My uh, my look for this is the uh, the gentleman. His name is Mark McCracken. He plays the pilot known as Too Tall. I remember thinking when I first seen this movie, I was like, God, that guy is really tall. I went back and looked him up for the purposes of this podcast, and he is one of the guys that they use to wear the the suit costume for the bull in uh, Where the Wild Things Are. Wow! So is he actually that tall, or was he standing on a box? Uh, yeah, he's actually that tall. Wow, that's entirely too tall. You, you call we haul. <laughs> so uh, Joseph Galloway, played by Barry Pepper in the movie, was awarded a Bronze Star for the gallantry of uh, carrying a wounded man to safety during the Battle of uh, Le Drang in uh, 1965. He's the only civilian awarded the Bronze Star during the Vietnam War. So that's kind of cool. Yep, that's pretty badass. So let's get into some movie superlatives. Tyler, you ready? I am. Who's your MVP? A little bit of a cop out, but you're not going to be able to argue with it. Is the real Hal Moore? He's a, a legend and yep. uh, retired uh, as the Lieutenant General, a three-star general, um, and then he he passed away in 2017. So he's my MVP. Mine as well. Brian, do you have an MVP? Yeah. Again, not as meaningful. Uh, I had to go <laughs> with my boy Sam Elliott. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Hang, hang, hang my head over here. All right. <laughs> not, not a problem. I mean, I'll let you go first on this one. So, uh, you know, when Tyler one ups us, it'll, it'll feel right. So, Tyler, uh, Brian, who, who is your best supporting actor? I'm gonna go with uh, Madeline Stowe, Moore's wife in this one. I felt like her entire performance, while well, you know, her her expressions before he leaves, while he's leaving. While he is gone, while giving the bad news to the other army wives, uh, she has one of the most expressive, tortured. Uh, I, it, it was she did it so well. Uh, basically, every time I saw her, it just she wore a face of someone you wanted to consult. Absolutely, no, that was a great. Yeah, when she uh, thought the taxi cab driver was there for her, I, I, she was great in that. Tyler, who's your best supporting? I would have to agree with Brian 100%. I wasn't going to say it quite as eloquently, but I came to the same conclusion. Okay, everybody likes who goes first on this one. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the road a little bit lesser travel on this one. I'm going to go Greg Kinnear. I thought he did a really good job with facial acting, of showing the being overwhelmed in the moment. As someone who would be going in and out of the conflict with helicopter and seeing the damage and the results and stuff like that, I thought that he did a good job of basically not computing and taking all that in and just being overwhelmed and but you still got to do your job and get the helicopter in and out of there to the point where you know get back to base and then when it really hits you that was a powerful scene to me so i i thought that greg kinnear did a pretty good job he usually does a pretty good job i liked him here as well totally agree with that hidden gem tyler so i'm going to go with chris klein as lieutenant jack giggin and he's a hidden gem because he's kind of cheesy you know throughout the movie and it's easy to chalk that up to bad acting. But, I mean, that's kind of how lieutenants are. They're idealistic and optimistic. And I would know because I used to be that lieutenant. So he's my hidden gem. Perfect. Brian, who's your hidden gem? Oh, uh, this is where I had my stockpile of actors I wasn't going to mention. So I was going to go with uh, Clark Gregg, uh, uh, Agent Coulson as uh, Captain Tom Metzger. And then John Hamm as Captain Matt Dillon. And then I'd laugh that his name was actually Matt Dillon. I'm going to go with uh, John Hamm as well. Just uh, a small small part in here. He goes on to be a bigger name later. And so I just thought that that is such a hidden gem. So recast. Tyler, if you had to recast somebody and put somebody else in their place, 
who are you recasting and who are you putting there in place? Okay, speaking of difficult names to pronounce, uh, Keith Zarbaka. He's the uh, diplomatic spook in the movie. So he only had like two scenes and a handful of lines, but I thought he delivered all of those very terribly. <laughs> and it's, it's just like is he rock. the is he the guy is he the guy that asks what's broken arrow no he well it's in yeah back in the the headquarters where they have all the maps and the radios and he's like it's a massacre and um Uh-oh. the melodramatic guy he's the guy answering the guy asking what's broken arrow yeah and he's constantly chain smoking i think literally anybody could have done a better job um uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I would recast Russell ah. Russell Guest as the new diplomatic spook. All right. There you go, Rhett. I'm up for the job. It's a massacre. Yeah. It's a massacre. <laughs> losing a... My God, it's a massacre. Losing a boat of draftees is a bad day. Losing a colonel is a massacre. That's the one. And had an airplane uh, pick the wrong day to stop sniffing glue. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Fry. Uh, fly. I'm Pilot. If you had to recast somebody, who are you recasting? Gosh, I, just, I feel like Tyler and I are going back and forth. I was gonna say I'd recast Chris Klein. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually uh, I was thinking about maybe a little bit of Heath Ledger magic on this one. Ooh, that would have been good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go with Chris Klein as well. I'm going to pick a lesser known Chris at that point in time, but he goes on to be a better known Chris. Chris Pine. He's 22 at that point, and uh, I think that he could uh, fill in well. I felt like Chris Klein was warm, but is there such a thing as just laying it on too thick? I felt like, what do you think about being a soldier and a father? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Laying it on too thick. I thought so. Somebody could have been more sincere in doing that. So that was that was where I came away with that. I'm I'm going I'm going after Chris Klein as well. And probably I'm a little biased. I don't think I've liked him in anything I've seen him in. So I think I came in prepared to not like him. (laughs) You didn't like him in American Pie. I I did not. Basically the exact same character. I did not. Yeah, I I was excited for America Pie too, and he just magically disappeared. Nobody said anything. He's like that. He's like the other daughter in Family Matters in the later seasons, where it's just like, isn't there another kid in this family? And then nobody says anything. She's nope. not there. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, I will admit that you've probably seen a hundred percent of his range in any movie you see him in. Oh, I I think so, uh, Tyler. What is your best shot of the movie? One of the helicopter scenes, it's not when they're first infilling LZ X-Ray, but I think kind of one of the the second or third uh, drop-offs, there's a bird's-eye view of all the Hueys as they're landing and the uh, soldiers disembarking, and uh, that's probably my favorite. Uh, the A close second, though, if I'm allowed to do that, is Colonel Moore's first footsteps on the LZ, which I know is supposed to be super dramatic, uh, but it, it worked for me. Okay. I myself actually picked that as my best shot of the movie when when he's taking the last boots off the ground, uh, referring back to the speech where he said, I'll be the first one off the helicopter and the last one right. on. And uh, I, I just felt like the pan up that went from his boots up to the sitting on the, the, the foot of the helicopter and then getting in. And then I like that. I like that pan, you know, at a first glance. And I have not seen this nearly as many times as you guys have. I do feel like Mel Gibson faded in and out of a kind of a southern accent on and off throughout the movie though because you get like well son that's the only thing i've heard today that makes sense and then you have other parts where you know his dictation like when he's talking to his family it sounds fine but then he says something like i'll leave no one behind so it just i feel like i feel like it fades back and forth from like heavy twang to not that's a good point so brian what about you best shot well my best shot uh, again i have a, a i have a bad habit of spoiling it early but the uh the whole choppers dropping down to the uh, absolute low altitude flight right before they drop them off with the music and you see them flying through the valleys and people looking up at them and you've got the assistant running into the cave going the helicopter soldiers are coming like that all of that with the music playing kind of led up to oh it's on guys it's on we're about to see it be on i like it and best scene tyler I think best scene is, as far as acting goes, is when the Alma Givens, she's the uh, African-American spouse, is given the news of her husband's death. And just her 
accurate portrayal of the you know initial feeling of denial and you know terrible uh, grieving i think it's the best scene i hey you stole my thunder that time that, that's mine <laughs> yeah no that, that 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 really got me i just like you said uh that was one of the places where in a movie with a lot of bad stuff that happens and a lot of emotional moments mm-hmm. that one that one somehow just sits in your stomach it's it's like the realization of all the weight of the impact of it so right. what about you brian We danced around this a lot, and I was like, please don't talk about this. Please don't talk about this. So my best scene is uh, when Ryan Hurst, Sergeant Savage, comes back after being cut off, and he's sitting there in the medical area, and Sam Elliott walks up and looks at him and says, that's a nice day, Sergeant Savage. Mm. (laughs) Just with the lighting and the artillery flashing in the background, and he's just, uh, you can tell he's just completely shocked by the whole thing. And then Sam Elliott walks up and basically, in, in my opinion, says the one thing to kind of shake him out of it. Like, oh, he finally returned my compliment. <laughs> Change one thing. Tyler. So there's a couple moments of great heroics that happened that I think would have been easy to incorporate into the movie um, that I think should have been incorporated. One of the big ones is as the Lost Platoon is realizing that they're cut off and they're say, they say you know you know go to the top of that knoll get the high ground what actually supported them getting to the high ground were two uh, machine gun teams and one team was able to break contact and get back up and the other team completely sacrificed themselves continued to uh, engage the enemy until they were overrun and subsequently killed so i think Think little sub stories like that could have been added to, you know, highlight the heroism of those soldiers. Yeah, and the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Brian, what about you? Change one thing. Uh, my change one thing. You know, there are several aspects of this movie that I really liked. I actually could have had a little bit more in depth on the training they were receiving prior to going in. One of my uh, kind of closet favorite Vietnam movies was a Colin Farrell movie called Tigerland. Oh yeah. But yeah, again, just more in-depth training on how they were preparing to deal with Vietnam itself. So I I could have gone for that. And, you know, like they say at the end of the movie, he was in country for another 200 and something odd days. I wouldn't have minded maybe just a quick, you know, this is what happened after. I'm not sure how they would have done it. I'm not trying to make this a thousand hour long movie, but um, just a little bit more detail of, of post-war, like at least him landing and somebody going, you did a hell of a job, Hal, or so, I don't know. It just, you know, they take off and then you go back to narration by Galloway and, and that was it uh, until he, you know, goes back home. And I was just kind of like, oh, oh, okay. Brian wants more as usual. I usually do. Yeah. So for me, my change one thing is going to be we spend 40 minutes of this movie trying to get set up. And I think we come to understand more in his world. But I don't think that I'm satisfied with establishing who the players are prior to this, with the exception of maybe Kinnear and uh, Chris Klein. So mm-hmm. I'm going to say I we, we really pay attention to Chris Klein so much. And I, I criticize it as saying, like, this is the guy the director basically said he's going to be one of the guys who's going to be standing at the end. Uh, with Sam Neill and Mel Gibson, but he's not. And in the end, he's no more important than John Hamm's character, Clark Gregg's character, anybody else's character. I want to de-emphasize that, and in part of it might be my subliminal, I don't like Chris Klein. I don't know. So just, you know, try and spread the, the mic, or the, the camera, I should say, around a little bit so that we can see the people interacting with each other. I saw some really nice deleted scenes where some guys were shooting by a lake, and they were talking about, you know, being assigned under more and how it was new. And they were talking about him and then talking about Sam Elliott's character as well. And I liked that. I wanted to see that because it was showing the men and their interactions with each other when their leaders aren't around. And so you connected with them in a nice way. So uh, you got 40 minutes. I'm surprised we didn't connect better. I'll agree with how much that I was down on how much time they spent on his character. But... They also, I think, wanted to kind of drive home, trying to get you to care about someone more because he was a casualty, and Carrie Russell's character needed to be have more emphasis. So I, I get you on that, but man, I was I was more upset when when Tom Metzger died. So Agent Coulson's character died. I was like, oh, I mean, he that whole piece 
I guess meant as much, if not more, to me as a as a, a sacrifice piece than Klein's did. Although I understand how they built his up more. So uh, there there were a lot of leadership pieces in there that I felt like they were not shy about showing those losses. No, you're right. And but uh, but like I said, after all that setup, the delivery to Carrie Russell's character didn't make the same emotional resonance to the note that Alma got that Tyler and I picked as our best scene in the movie. She's in there very little time. We see her husband very little time, but boy, it sure makes an emotional impact. So Mm -hmm. Tyler, best quote of the movie. Best quote is going to seem odd, and I doubt you guys are going to, uh, I'm going to step on your toes here, but it's when Howmore is talking to your favorite character, uh, Chris Klein, in the chapel, and uh, Colonel Moore says... They're talking about the bracelet, and he says, you leave that on, that's an order. So that's an odd quote, but let me unpack it here a little bit. So wearing a bracelet like that is technically against uniform regulation, right? And Moore, as the commanding officer, is ordering his subordinate to essentially break regulation. Uh, But that's because Colonel Moore cares more about Jack as a person than Jack as a regulation or as a soldier. And this is a key to Colonel Moore's leadership and I think a good example of, of how to be a leader for everyone. Ah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I didn't realize how against the rules that would have been. Brian, what is your best quote of the movie? You know, I got to stick with my guy here. Mel Gibson had so many good monologues in this movie, but the best one was punctuated by Sam Elliott saying, any of you some bitches call me grandpa. I'll kill you. <laughs> That's a good one. He had a, he had, he was a quote machine. I'm gonna go with Mel Gibson's Colonel Hal Moore when he said, "Nothing's wrong except when there's nothing wrong." I just like mm-hmm. that. It's so true, and you can apply that to lots of things. Yep. Yeah, yep. good commander's instinct right there. So. Tyler, is there anything you want to plug? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So while everything else I've said tonight doesn't solely my opinion and doesn't necessarily represent the position of the Army or any part of the government, what I'm going to plug now, I'm sure the Army would endorse, and that's if anybody listening to this got their blood pumping from watching the movie. You know, once the is interested in the Army, then I would highly encourage you to do so. Um, lots of opportunities out there, whether you want to be, you know, the, the how more leader or the combat photographer like Joe Galloway or flying helicopters, then, uh, those are all options in the army and I'd go check out goarmy.com. That's a great one. I actually had a quick question about the people who are casting this movie. Are they much older than the people who would actually be on the ground? It felt like this was an older group of men than would be inserted into this situation. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't have enough experience with the Vietnam era and drafty era, but and promotion rates were, were different back then. But I, I would say it's fairly close. Okay, okay. I, I just thought there weren't enough guys in their twenties there, but well, the, the focus was mostly all the characters were the leaders, right? So they're going to be a little bit older. There's only a few young soldiers uh, featured in the movie. True. All right. It's time of the show to give this a rating. And Tyler, on a five-star scale, half-star intervals, what would you rate We Were Soldiers? Absolutely a five. The kind of movie you keep coming back to and you really enjoy. Love it. And uh, Brian, what about you? I still give the most intense amount of love for one of the most rewatchable movies that I have. I'm going to give it a four-star just because I'm I'm super hesitant to, to go all out. On, on anything. I'm sure it'll happen. I may have done it already. I don't, I don't actually recall. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've, you've gone five before. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to give this one a four. Uh, it, it does have a couple things that, that could have been better, but four with love. I'm with you. I think this... I really enjoyed this more than I enjoy most military movies. It's not normally my best genre, but I enjoyed this one more than most of those, and I just really appreciate them looking back home to the wives. I really appreciate them showing that the men and their kinship to each other, I think it captured those things well, and so I, I liked all of that. And, uh, yeah, there's there's some blemishes, as we've already talked about, So, uh, but overall... Four is a good rating, and this this goes down well for me. Tyler, thank you so much, man. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun for me. All right. Yeah, really appreciate you having, or having you. Brian, you want to help me pick a movie for next time? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Tim Curry's been a big hit for this year. Let's, do, let's hit Tim Curry again one more time. 
How about option one, It from 1990. From 1960, a seven preteen outcast fight an evil demon who possess a child killing clown. 30 years later, they reunite to stop the demon once and for all when it returns to their hometown. Option two, the Rocky Horror Picture Show from 1975. The newly engaged couple have a breakdown in an isolated area and must pay a call to the bizarre residence of Dr. Frankenfurter. And option three, Legend from 1985. A young man must stop the Lord of Darkness from destroying daylight and marrying the woman he loves. Starring Tom Cruise and Tim Curry. There are a couple on here that... Uh, actually, I, I have not really... I use really in quotes really seen any of these movies so i'm gonna go with rocky horror since it's the the cultish of the three let's do the time warp again all right that'll make more sense to you next week but it makes sense to everybody else now so uh tyler thank you so so much man you bet everybody uh thank your armed services whether it be army navy marines coast guard anybody out there who's making that sacrifice to serve their country it's Veterans Day, and we want to appreciate them. And so we appreciate you, Captain Tyler Fitzgerald. We appreciate you too, Brian Fry. Oh, thank you. I, I don't do much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, farewell. And remember, all you Lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, we want to invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. Those iTunes uh, ratings and reviews really, really help the show. Please give us a five-star there because that helps others find the show. makes a really big difference. And give us a like on Facebook if you want to follow along and communicate with us. We're also on Twitter at at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com, all one word. If you enjoy the show, want to go into a deeper dialogue, or even if you want to be on the show. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Brian? I don't usually give hints on my quotes, but here is another Barry Pepper great. What I mean, sir, is if you was to put me here with this here sniper rifle anywhere up to and including one mile of Adolf Hitler with a clean line of sight, we'll pack your bags, boys. War's over. <laughs>